First of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizer for inviting me here. It's always a great pleasure to, uh, to visit Marseille, and this is my favorite place. So uh, the topic is about Levy diffusion of billiards with flight point. And this is uh, the outline of the talk. So first of all, I'll explain to you a, a long journey to search for a special family of billiards that which have uh, arbitrary slow decay correlations. And then uh, it took like almost more than 10 years, more than 10 years to eventually find this uh, ideal kind of billiards with the decay rate cor correlation to be arbitrarily slow. And then later on, I had some joint work with Paul Zhang, who is a probabilist, and we proved the, state, the convergence to stable law. And, uh, and also a recent work, in recent work with Paul Zhang and also Francois, we were able to prove the convergence to Levy diffusion process. And in the main uh, theory, our, main, our goal is not only to prove the limiting theory, but also we want to characterize the diffusion uh, coefficient. So those are three works. And uh, the last work, we just been submitted like a month ago. And uh, there's one thing I want to say that after we submit, right after we submitted the paper, and we found out that Ian Melbourne and also his co-author also submitted a paper about the uh, about result in Levy process. But we we uh, discovered, we discussed, we studied the convergence to Levy from different angle, and also the method accumulate uh, different. So both paper are in archive, and you're welcome to take a look. And the method by Ian and his uh, co-author. A kind of very nice, so we start from a different, very general um, dynamical system point of view, and then they consider different convergence in different topology. But again, here we have very concrete situation. And of course, uh, the billiards I presented here is kind of new, and so I'm, I'm happy to see there are more uh, probability theory can be proved in this direction. So, um, because there are many experts in this audience, I think they're from probability theory, you may not be familiar on billiards. So in that case, you just imagine billiards is just a special type of dynamical system. And here, I'm concentrating only on two-dimension billiard. So the, the domain is a two-dimension domain, and we have a map, billiard map, which preserve a measure. And also, the billiard here, we assume that they have strong chaotic property, for example, they are mixing. They are mixing dynamical system, and then you take an observable, take an observable, and we have, we can define the stationary stochastic process, and of course they are dependent. So now we are asking, well, since they are dependent process, and about the limiting theory, that is true for IID case, are they still true here? So of course the first thing we, we are interested in is about the decay rate of correlations. And then if they decay really fast, and then we expect to have the classical central limit theory. And altogether we have, and in particular under the condition of the green Kubal formula, so the diffusion constant can be written as the infinite series of the covariance. And so the, the, the main question we are interested in here is that then the convergence of the decay correlation is really slow when the uh, green Kuba formula fails. For that kind of situation, what kind of limiting theory do we expect? Well, um, of course, there are, again, there are many, uh, already many results, and also from this talk and from the reference, there are many results about convergence to stable law, convergence to Levy process. For example, in expanding map, and there is a very famous a uh, famous model which was constructed by Leveroni, Sandro, and Soso, and then they, they have arbitrarily slow decay correlation, and also the stable law result was proven by very very beautiful result by Dunker and also Giselle, so they proved the convergence to stable law and also Levy process. And then you may wonder why do I need to search for billiards? Because billiards is a kind of, it's kind of physical originated system. So in particularly, Lawrence Geis was created 
by around, so Lawrence guys was created by around, by Lawrence in around 1905. So that is uh, the simplest the physical model that can be really used to understand the diffusion from a chemical point of view, from physical point of view. So imagine here you have um, a periodic area of scatterers. <coughs> And you can imagine this is like corresponding to the ions in the microscopic world. And then the billiard particle can be viewed as electrons. Electrons, so they are very, very tiny. So we, you can start with the initial distribution of infinitesimal particles, and then we try to understand what is the diffusion behavior by different arrangement of the scatterers. So, um, I, we can define Qn to be the position of the particle at time n, and then here uh, Qn can be written as the summation of the displacement function. The displacement function is, can be, it's just the stationary, stationary process that I defined on the billiard map. And also, by the way, this Lawrence gas model was constructed around 1906, 05, 06, by Lawrence. And it take like almost two, like almost 60 years until 1960 and C9 was able to translate this physical model to mathematical model and that is the so-called dis the C9 billiard, and he was able to prove the agudicity of C9 billiard. So according to the agudicity, we have this, you have the strong law of large number, and then so you can say that the diffusion, the, the, the position of the particle at time n, this is essentially controlled, uh, so there's a drift, even essentially there's a drift which is corresponding to the expected value of the displacement function. And for classical billiard, and also we can, you assume by the uh, isotropic property, the expected value of the, um, the, 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 the displacement is zero. It's zero for the classical situation. So that means that the, the diffusion of particles in this region, in this domain, is only controlled by the diffusion term. So that the drift term is zero. And of course, there are some other studies. For example, this was original model for the flow of electrons. And then you can, if you put the external forces, external force or maybe magnetic field, and then the drift term doesn't need to be zero anymore. In that situation, the drift has a physical meaning. It's called electrical current, electrical current. So here we're interested in the case when the drift is zero. And then if we are lucky, we can, you, can, you can prove one proof. In fact, for dispersing billiard, the central limit theory, the invariance principle was proved. And that means that the, the diffusion on this, uh, for this kind of Lawrence, Lawrence guys is well understood. It's understood is, the, is controlled by the classical diffusion that converts to the Brown emotion. So the question here we want to study is the fact, is the case that when the correlation decay smaller, I mean slower than one over n, much smaller, so for a belong to um, the range of zero, one. Well, um, based just to summarize, there are three types of diffusion that we can expect. One is the classical diffusion. Classical diffusion, you have the classical central limit theory, and the diffusion behavior is kind of closely related to the rate of decay correlations. And the second case is the kind of, um, the, the, it's the stretch hole case that A equals to one. Oh, sorry. Where's my light? Oh, here, oh, sorry. So, and also the case, the case we are interested here is this one, and we expect it to prove the stable law and also the convergence to Levy. Um, I want to uh, review a few uh, reference that has been done for the A equals to one case and for the billiard, for especially for billiards. So for A equal to one case, the first work uh, was done by, um, by Peter Barland and uh, Sebastian Guzel and around 2006, and that was the first result in, this field, in the field of, of chaotic billiard where they proved the central limit theory for stadium. And that was, uh, again, very, very beautiful result, and they are able to obtain the concrete, uh, the precise formula for the diffusion constant. And then Sars and Waldrio, they were able to study to obtain the central limit theory for uh, Lawrence guys with infinite horizon. And then later on, Chernoff, Dogopiad, and also Peter Balland also drawn, and then they studied the limiting theory for billiards with CASP, uh, the, the dispersing case. 
And then finally, uh, and again, all these results, all these uh, different paper, they use different methods. So for example, uh, Barlin, Peter, and also um, Giselle, they used the spectral uh, analysis, which following the, the scheme of, uh, from Dunker, and also, and also Chernoff and Dalkin, and also uh, Peter, they study, they used uh, about using like, the probability method, probability method. So then later on with my student, my PhD student, we're able to um, construct a new method. We use like the Martingale approximation, and which is pretty simple from, from, our, from my point of view. And we, we kind of, it's kind of unified method and we proved uh, for general uh, non-uniform hyperbolic system with decay correlation of order one over n. And we also uh, we are able to express uh, concrete explicitly about the diffusion constant using which is related to the one step transition averaging. Well here again our, uh, so the, the question left here is to search for billiards which has arbitrarily slow decay correlations and I'll tell you the, the, the story, it was a really painful story. But anyway, so the, uh, a very naive idea is the following. If you have completely dispersing billiards, means like if the boundary has no zero curvature point, and then we expect fast decay correlation and that to lead to the classical diffusion. So then the question is that, what if I add some point has, which has zero curvature? Zero curvature. And also there are two types of billiards to consider. Um, oh, here. Here. So, so now we start with the C9 billiard and then we modify a little bit. So on this boundary, so right here we put um, two flight points. So the boundary is, has, um, has approximately has equation y equal to x to the beta plus one. And beta is um, parameter larger than two. So if you take the second derivative and evaluate it at zero, then you have zero curvature. So and also it's a symmetric and you have a, per, a pair of periodic point, periodic trajectory like reflecting between these two uh, flight point. And that somehow slow down the decay rate of correlations. And also there are two types of uh, this kind of, you can arrange the scatterers, for example, for example, if we have the finite horizon case, and that is corresponding to this situation, this is the finite horizon case. And another way to arrange, to modify the table is to make the, two, the left boundary and the right boundary to be flat. And that is the infinite horizon corresponding to the semi-dispersing case. So we put, we modify both table and put flight point there, like a symmetric, so we can cook up a periodic trajectories. So the result um, like, took like more than 10 years apart to, to consider to finish these two, um, two uh, situations. So in 2005, it's, with Chernoff, we considered the billiard with finite horizon, and we were able to prove that the decay correlation is uh, depend on the parameter bit. But the bit as bit um, goes to close to two, and you have arbitrarily fast decay correlation as bit goes to infinity, the decay rate is approximately uh, one over n. And then for the infinite horizon case, it took, took like more, almost 10 years and to prove, but there's nothing interesting. It's just like the result come out to be one over n, but that is really surprising to me, and I will tell you. So it took me a few years to prove, and then took me more years to to check it because I didn't believe that right, is the correct result. <laughs> so I'll tell you, I'll explain to you why. Because this is this was the picture that was kind of misleading. So I remember I gave this, uh, the talk, uh, a talk last year, also here, and I, I also presented the picture, and then there was a meeting in the afternoon just discuss what's going on here. So then I realized what is going on here. So, um, so this is the, the, so the top region, and so there is a pair of flight point, and which is parameterized by beta. So if you let beta goes to infinity, and the top and the, the lower bound, they become up, kind of flight, they convert, they are kind of flight, flatten out. For example, if I add two pairs of flight point, and that is, I mean, theoretically, in principle, we seem that they converge to the square right on the right hand side. On the right hand side, if you have a square uh, scatter, there's no, not chaotic at all. And then it's so, so by that picture, it really convinced me that the diffusion, count, the diffusion, uh, I mean, the, the correlation speed should be, can be arbitrarily slow. So I didn't believe why it was one over one. 
The main reason you have this one over n is like those two counterpoints. So once you let beta goes to infinity, there's no way you can kill the curvature of those two counterpoints. I mean, there's a four, there are four counterpoints on this region, and the counterpoint, the curvature turns out that to go to infinity, and those four counterpoints really count, count uh, the fact that there you have fast decay correlation there, so that's count our uh, reading about the, the strong mixing. The mixing, so that is why, that is why it cannot decay arbitrarily slow. And also another reason I want to tell you why, why is that for this infinite horizon case, not only there exists one pair of trajectory that running between these two flight points, but it, there exists a sequence, a sequence of periodic trajectories running between these two, two um, flight points. And also the periodic trajectory, the period gets longer, 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 goes to infinity. So that was another reason, another trap that I really believed it should decay, curve, decay slowly, but it turns out that although the computation and everything was very complicated, but it turns out to be one over one. So, so the search, so this search was kind of failed. So, uh, okay, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So then um, the main reason uh, that the decay correlation is kind of, uh, is pretty persistent for this case is one over n, it's because of the existence of this channel, of this channel, and now we think about that, for example, instead of putting a flat point, we just put a flat pieces there, and that still doesn't change the rate of decay correlation, so that maybe that is more, even more trivial from, from right now if we think about that. So now we have, so the main idea is now is that we want to kill this, the, the channel, how do I kill the channel? So we take these two flight points and we pinch them together. We pinch them together and now we have billiards with cusp. So this billiards with cusp uh, is tangent, is tangent. So these two boundary are tangent at flight point. And now the hope is that, well, maybe we can prove that the decay correlation can be arbitrarily slow. And this really works, really, this really works. So uh, I was able to prove that the correlation decay rate is one over a bit minus one. A bit is any number larger than two. As bit goes to infinity, this can be arbitrarily slow because I will eventually prove, talk about the alpha stable law. So there's an alpha related, which alpha is defined right here, alpha equals to bit over bit minus one. And if you replace alpha for beta there, and the decay rate is n to the negative alpha minus one. And this is also only a, a small range because alpha in Giselle's talk, and alpha, for example, if you prove stable law, alpha can be, should be run from zero to two. But now this is only covered range from one to two, from one, because we have finite uh, expect, expectation. So, um, well, uh, the, main, the main reason, the main idea of to prove the decay correlation is that we use the inducing, so we are trying to, we are trying to put this, um, because the only bad part is here. So now we define the good part over there, and that is our indu induced domain, and uh, we can, then we can define the first return time. The first return time function means that if you take a collision on the good boundary and you count how many times it come back to visit this boundary, and also we can define the induced, the induced map. The induced map only see collisions on this good part, on the good part. It doesn't count any collisions when the particle run into the cast. So this, is, this way we define a induced map, and this is uh, in the phase space about the level curves of the induced map. So the right hand side is the good part, is where the induced map is defined. And the left hand, so this entire picture is the original phase space. And this is the two cusp, the, the boundary for the two cusp. In the middle corresponding to the cusp, because when you enter the cusp, although we only see, we can only imagine there's a tangential direction, but there are other directions. There are other directions, so there's a whole line, the full line of cusp there. So what happened is that if you take a point in this Mn, Mn corresponding to R equals to N, so then the particle will enter the cusp for N iterations. So you point in Mn prime, it will enter from the top, and after N iteration in this two gray region, after N iteration, it will come out. So uh, in order to calculate, so this is very, it's also very important to calculate what is the tail bound of the return time function, and that is related to, to estimate What's the measure of that region, the, this, this, um, the ellipt elliptical region? And that is also related to estimate 
the measure of this entire cusp, which is bounded by the two green region. And luckily, uh, we are able to, to compute the, uh, the equation of the curve for the boundary is cosine phi uh, equals approximately x to the base, negative base power. And that uh, gives us a rather precise estimation of the tail bound. Uh, so this is uh, some, some very some light simple geometry. So Mn is the, um, the level size for r equals to n. And we estimate the dimension, the dimension, and also the measure. And that tells us that the measure of r equals to n, the measure of r equals to n is, is uh, given by n to the negative alpha. And if you uh, extend the return time function, that becomes the first heating time function in the entire phase space. And that will be n to the negative one or beta minus one. And this is basically the decay rate of correlation that we, we proved. And now uh, we are going to study the, the limiting theory. So I take, so we start with a uh, holder continuous function on the entire space. So we assume that f is holder continuous. And also uh, because, uh, because everything, the, the interesting ingredient is really in the cusp. So when we take observables, we try to, we try to make sure that the observable is non-trivial near the cusp. And for example, uh, if you take observable, which is only non-trivial in, in the induced space, and it's zero, completely zero here, and according to a, a recent result with central variety, and we prove, you can prove the optimal bound of decay correlation. And furthermore, for example, if you take observable only, only supported on the induced phase space, and also assume that this observable has zero expected value. And that observable has fast decay correlation, which is one order fast. One order fast, that means that if you take observable there, you don't have to see the stable law, you have the regular diffusion. So here we have to, uh, we really assume that F is non-trivial. So take a, a small neighborhood that contains the entire cusp region, and we assume that this F has the same sign, so there's no cancellation when you involve in the, in the region. And we also assume, we also define this induced function, which takes, uh, accumulate all the values in the cusp before it come out. So basically, you take a point there, take a point there, and then, and okay, first imagine the, the observable is defined on whole phase space, right? You take a point there, and you add all the values in this cusp, and then it come out. So that is how the F tilde is defined. And then, uh, so in order to study the, the statistical properties, and we, can, we have two, two processes. And one process is defined by the original, original map, original observable, and the new process is defined by the induced, by the induced system. So there are two, there are two sequences, two Birkhoff sums, S N F, and also S N tilde, F tilde. So um, there was a theory we proved that if we can prove that for the induced process to satisfy a stable law. And then the original system also satisfy the same stable law. Just that the only difference is the diffusion constant. And the diffusion constant is have a different, have a precise scale, which is the measure of the induced map. Okay, so this was uh, the statement we proved with, I proved with Paul Zhang and we, we precisely calculated the diffusion constant. So there are two quantities I want to introduce. And one is called I sub f. And that is uh, related to the, the integral of the observable along the curve, uh, along the vertical line. And I also assume that, so when you look at the phase space on the left hand side, uh, we assume the, um, the R coordinate is R prime and the right hand side is R double prime. So in other words, the function F doesn't have to be continuous on the left and on the right. They, they, they can be non-continuous because that is a singularity curve. But I still so but so in that case, but I still need to integrate the function value on this vertical line, and also that is called I one I F, and also I one is just the scale, this scale, and these two quantity two quantity we use them uh, very often. So we prove this stable law, and more precisely, the diffusion constant is related to the diffusion uh, diffusion constant for the return time function, and altogether with precisely this ratio. 
Another question is that, well, what is sigma r, which is the diffusion for the return time function? And we can precisely calculate them using the, the tail bound for the return time. Remember in this, remember we had this formula. So the tail bound is approximately n to the negative alpha. If you write this separate, in a different way, and that is really saying, okay, the, the measure of r larger than n to the one over alpha is of order one over n. And I think this one is, looks really familiar for, for people working on, on this field. And so if we multiply n on the left-hand side, and this is really, okay, this is almost equals to one. And basically, let's say we don't care, we don't care what is the quantity. And it turns out that this constant is really important. So we prove, we prove that if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, and this constant is nothing else but the diffusion constant for the return time function. So this is exactly when you take the limit as n goes to infinity, that quantity is, kind of, is very important and you can compute precisely is this right hand side and that is well, two, two I1, I1 was that integral of cosine <coughs> one or alpha and also the parameter bit is also included here. So as you increase the parameter, and you have some kind of smaller, um, smaller diffusion constant. So that was that is the diffusion constant for the return time function for the original, and then we have this scale, so you can you can calculate again precisely. So this is one thing I'm, I really like to work on concrete systems, so I can under have a better picture and which parameter works, which parameter uh, have play a different role. Okay, so now I'm going to change my, my topic a little bit. So for the previous example, I only have one cusp. And now we're asking, what if I have three cusps? And what kind of different, different stable law I'm going to get? And will that change the diffusion constant? So here, we just for simplicity, I'm considering three, uh, a table with three identical boundaries, just to, for simplicity. And then there are three cusps. So, so we can define the same quantity as we did before. And now the question is that what is the stable law? What's the limit of the stable law? Okay, so this is uh, the recent joint work with Francois and Paul Zhang. So we are able to prove for the, uh, the stable law for both return time function and also for the induced function. And of course, use the general theory, you can push back to the original system. So interesting, an interesting thing, thing uh, we found out is that the limit. So for the return time function, this is just a, the stable law, which we, we saw it in the one, in the one cusp situation. But for the induced, induced function, and this limit is the summation of three independent random variables. So this is the summation of three independent stable variables, and each one is over C one cusp. Each one will see one cusp, and also we are able to prove the diffusion constant on each each different cusp, and that you can you can see is really look familiar. So the only thing we have different is this one third, this one third. So because when you add the the IID for a stable law, you still have a stable law. So this is also a stable law with different parameters, and the parameter again can be computed differently. Because although we assume that in the beginning the the table is completely symmetric, but in terms of variable, the variable can take different values on different cusps. So that vary, the value of the, uh, run, of the random variable f, and that also plays, the, plays an important role to make distinctions about these three, three cusps. So this was the, the result we, we proved. Okay, so, so that is the result about stable law. Now we are moving to the interesting part about the convergence to Levy process. In order to study Levy process, we need to introduce the Skorohout space. Skorohout space on, on zero one, it contains all the cat-like cat -like functions, which is right continuous and has life limit. So in this, uh, in this space, there are, um, my, there are many, many types of uh, metric you can introduce. The most easy one is the, uh, infin the infinity norm to make this to be a uniform, to define uniform topology on this space. But unfortunately, this, uh, this space is not separable, so, it, so there are a lot of limitations, and that is why Skorohout and he introduced four different topology, four different metrics. 
and which are called J1, J2, M1, M2. So here we only concentrated on J1 and J1 and M1. J1 norm and M1 norm make the, um, the space to be separable. And also, uh, so I want to introduce a little, give you a little bit details. So J1 topology is, uh, is the funnest, that is very close to the uniform topology. So in other words, if you have, um, if you have a sequence converged to another, a different path, and if for the continuous part, it's just uniform convergence. But if you have a jump, so uh, if you have a jump, the J1 topology, the J1, J1 metric really implies, really requires that not only you have uniform convergence in the continuous part, for the jump part, the jump size have to be converged, have to be converged. And I will show you some pictures later. But, but there is a drawback here for the J1 topology, that is if you have, if there is a jump function, if you take indicator function, and then we always like to take continuous function to a, a sequence of continuous function to approximate this, this jump function, but that doesn't, doesn't converge in this J1 topology because the continuous function have no jumps. So to, to overcome this difficulty, Skorohout also include, uh, introduced the M1 topology. The M1 topology, the main idea is to introduce um, a complete graph. A complete graph, it means that you, so if, you have, um, if you have a jump, so this is a path which is right continuous and with a life limit. And what is the complete graph here? It's just you complete, you draw a solid line, and this is called a complete graph of this path with jump. So um, if you want to compare the distance of two paths uh, in the M1 top, in the M1 matrix, all you have to look at is their com how how far away are those the complete graph is. If the complete graph are very close, and then we say okay, they are close in the M1 M1 uh, topology. So this is a very nice picture that uh, Francois drew, she, he drew for me, and then I want to ex, uh, explain to you. So this picture has three, has four examples, just to explain to you the difference between J1 topology and M1 topology. So in the first example is that, so the black one is the limit, and the right one is the right one corresponding to a sequence approximation. So then. So what they were asking in the first picture, the difference, what's the difference between these two, um, two um, paths in J1 topology? And also what's the difference in M1 topology? And both are one over N. So as N gets larger and larger, then you can imagine that this right curve approximating to the black, the dark, the black one. And in the second, in, because they both have the, the jump size also converge. In the second picture is that uh, the right, in the right path, there is an extra jump here. And the extra jump is one half, and that is persistent. Persistent as you're taking the limit. So this one half doesn't co converge to the jump size of the limit, which is one. So in that city, for the second example, um, the limit as you take in n goes to infinity, the red one doesn't converge to the, to the black one in J1 topology, but in the M1 topology, they converge. And in the third one is the example I was talking about, about this, when you approximate a, a, a path with jump by using continuous functions, and that you only converge in the M1 topology, but not in the J1 topology. And in the last example is that, so although you see that in the right, in, for the right colored, you can make the jump, so the jump size is kind of persistent, is one half, but you can make the length to be converged to zero. But this one doesn't converge in both topology, so that is why uh, you, we, a scholar have, have to introduce J2 topology, M2 topology, so that one is only converged, you, if you're interested, it converge in, in M2 topology. Well, okay, so now we consider, uh, first of all, we consider the process introduced by the induced by the induced system. And then recently, so with uh, Francois and Paul, we proved that um, for the induced process and this scale, this um, catalytic fun catalytic process converge to the um, to the alpha stable lightly motion with jump in J1 topology. J1 is pretty strong, but still we are able to prove it in the J1 topology. And this um, the lightly process Lightly process again, so for the three cusp situation, it is uh, in fact the summation of three independent process. 
And you see the parameter are very familiar. It came from the previous work, which I'm not going to uh, repeat here. Um, okay, so the main idea of the proof is that uh, we start, we, we start from, from the first return time function. We start from this first return time function and we scaled it differently because remember what is IFY and that is characterized on each different cusp. So we define this function to be F0 tilde and then, all, and then this one has zero and also by the way, F we started with has zero expectation. So this one has zero expectation and I, I iterate this one under the induced map and rescale it and this defines a triangle triangular area. And this triangular area, and also we can define the continuous, I mean, not the, the continuous time process. So um, according to this triangular area, you can define this um, as family of point process, a point, point size, and counting how many times it, it's a point coming to visit this region. And we can also define the Poisson point, point process. And here we have everything all concrete with intensity given by the density. And this one you see is very, again, it came, it was the diffusion constant. But I put a parameter here, x, and this x is changing. X changing, so that is the diffusion coefficient function, and and we are able to prove that this point process converge to the Levy process in distribution, and we gave two proof of the argument, and one proof is that we really we use a very nice result by Francois and Salzo. And they, they gave us sufficient, in the paper, they gave us sufficient condition on what kind of point process can converge to the Poisson process. So what we did is that we checked the condition and everything works fine. So we were able to prove the convergence to the Poisson process, and that is the first step. And one lemma we use is a, is a, is a very, very nice result by uh, this lady, Trine Kaminska, in 2010. And she, she was able to prove that under two conditions. If you first prove the convergence to Poisson process, and then you, prove, you check the second condition. The second condition is related to the vanishing of small values. And if we can check these two conditions, and then you can conclude that the convergence to Levy. So, so we were very lucky and we found this advanced tool that we can use so that we don't have to prove from the scratch how to converge to Levy, so we just to check these two conditions. And the first condition was already checked. The second condition, the second condition mainly follows from the, uh, the common goal of maximal inequality inequality and which was stated for the IID case. So that is stated that if the maximum of the summation larger than lambda is less than one or lambda squared of variance. So here, uh, if you move back and you see that this is the maximum of the summation, summation larger than some, some number, but here we have epsilon, we have epsilon, and this has also have a small values. So essentially, we are able to prove that this thing is of order one over n to the some epsilon, one plus epsilon power. So when you take n goes to infinity, epsilon goes to infinity, the right-hand side goes to zero, if we apply the, uh, to the, the maximum inequality. But the problem here is that the inequality was stated, was proved for the IID case. So we need some kind of deal with the dependent situation. But fortunately, we have, uh, the, we have the exponential decay correlations for the induced map. So this is the multiple decay correlation. Multiple decay correlation, if this two, two C, so you have all these multiple, uh, multiple um, sites. And if, if these two have distance with its K of order K, and you have this exponential decay. And we also need another one, that is what if these two sides are very, very close, for example, I and J, on, on the difference only one, and what do you have? And here we use a very powerful tool that was the originally designed by, by Chernoff and also Dagopiat, which is called Gross Lima. So we're able to prove that even though when I and J, the difference is kind of order one or whatever, very small, there is a uniform control, which is, uh, this is of order one over and to the one plus epsilon. So combining this fact and also the maximum inequality, we're able to check the second condition so that lead to the convergence of Levy process. So just to summarize, we have proof for the induced map, the convergence to Levy process and everything is nice. And now the question is like, well, what happened to the original system? 
what happened to the original system? So what can we say to the original system? Do we have to pr prove it from the scratch? But again, um, very luckily, so we, are, we have another advanced tool. So this was a theory proved by, uh, by Ian Melbourne and, and also by Mueller who both are here. So we, bene we really benefited from their theory. So they were able to prove that, well, now you have two processes. One is the induced process and the other is the original, is the process associated with original map. And if you can prove the convergence to Levy for the induced process, and, all in, and also here, so here there's something different, that is in the convergence is in M1 topology. And if this one's in M1 topology, and then you can conclude that the original system, original process, uh, the process associated to the original system also converge in M1 topology. But under the condition that we have to check this, this condition. F star, and F star looks, looks kind of complicated here. But I mean, um, so what's the me really meaning, the real meaning of this F star is that you want to count what's the change of the sign. The change of the sign, so when X enter, for example, in our situation, when X enter into the cusp, and you have to count how many signs it change. So we want to make sure that the change of the sign is not comparable to n to the one over alpha, that is small o, so that converge to zero. But for us, we just make things simple, we kind of make things simpler. We assume that if the observable have the same sign in a neighborhood of each cusp. And of course, for different cusp, they can have different signs, but in each, each cusp, the sign have to be the same. If the, there's no change of sign, so that condition automatically holds. So for us, again, we're kind of pretty lucky. And for this situation, we proved, we applied to our system, and we obtained the, the complete, the full version of the, um, the convergence to Levy process, but that is in M1 topology. Um, well, you may ask, well, you remember that for the induced, for the induced system, we proved the convergence in J1 topology. And now here the statement is in M1 topology. And so you may ask, well, is that the optimal result? Can you prove the original process also converge in J1 topology? And the answer is actually, the answer is actually no. So here we can, uh, we can give a proof, the proof for the non-J1 topo, the, uh, the non-convergence in the J1 matrix for the original map. So even, although for the original induced map, we can prove in the J1 topology, but for the original map, you cannot. And we, and, and we proved why. And again, this proof was um, constructed by Francois, and it's very, very nice proof. So um, what we start is that we, we prove by way of assumption, assume that the original process converged to Levy in J1. And what you do is that you just construct this continuous process. So just this is the, assume WT is the continuous process obtained by taking linearization. Every time you have a jump, you just like try to linearize it. So this is a continuous. You start with a continuous process instead of a process with jump. And because uh, original observable F is holder continuous on the whole phase space. So it is bounded. It's a bounded function, uniform bounded. So that means that these two process, two, pro, two, <coughs> pro, two um, original sequence, they're uniformly bounded and also converge to zero, converge to zero as n goes to infinity. And that means that if you assume that original process converge to the limit, the limit which is Levy process in J1, and this better one, which is the continuous, the small wn is a continuous process. I mean, the process with continuous paths, sorry. This one is, has continuous paths, also converge to the limit in J1. But now we have a problem. So, so this, is, this, path, this process has continuous paths. And that converges in J1. But in J1, if you have a continuous path, and that's equivalent to the, convert, the uniform convergence. And that implies that this WT is a continu is a process with continuous paths, and which is which is uh, contradict to the fact that we already show that it's a Levy process with jumps. So that um, concludes. So there's a contradiction, and that implies that the original process cannot 
converge in the J1 topology. Okay, so um, that's, that's all. This is the, all the references. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was not able to follow the uh, the talk uh, in some details uh, and in general line. Uh, one comment only about references. Uh, Tiran Kaminska is the right reference, but uh, she was not the first one in this respect. There are papers uh, and books by, by Reznik uh, in early uh, 80s and by Davis and Reznik papers in early 80s. So exactly the condition is clear for everybody working with, with uh, the condition two, uh -huh. working with uh, point processes that uh, uh, this is necessary. This is a drawback of a point process method to, to have this condition. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, only when you show the point processes, uh, convergence of point processes, then I realize what is the mechanism uh, to, to get stable limits in your case. Because at the beginning you were discussing uh, covariances, the decay of covariances, and usually uh, when the decay of covariances is very, very slow, slow yeah. Then we have something that is long-range dependence, and long-range dependence does not imply any convergence to, to, to stable lows. Uh, it's, it's a completely different story. Mm -hmm. But of course, it may happen that uh, out of the uh, covariance structure, you can get in the background uh, convergence to, to stable uh, processes, and uh, it seems to be your case. Um, I looked at the papers, and uh, <laughs> Uh, at your papers and uh, at the paper by, by uh, I.M. Melbourne, and I saw that uh, I was not able to deduce that from your talk, that you get the point processes convergence uh, using uh, uh, the Young Tower methods, yeah? No, we didn't. No? no we didn't use Young Tower and method, and, and Yen is an expert. He used that, in that approach, Yen is, is my expert, so he used. But for our case, we use uh, probability theory. So as I was seeing that for the convergence to the, for the point, uh, point size convergence, we pro in the paper we provided two methods. And one, one method was a modification that when we use, when, when we use with, uh, in the paper for convergence to stable law by, with um, Zhang Pao. So it's a pure <coughs> probability method. And another method is, so we have two proofs. Another method is that we use a uh, uh, result by Franz Vaz. Maybe this one was in, for Young Tower. Or oh, this one? Go okay. so ahead. <laughs> so maybe this is getting a little bit technical. <laughs> Let's just get the answer from Francoise. And then. Thank you. Uh, in our paper with Benoit, we applied our uh, general results to Young Towers, but they are true in a more general context, and we did not use Young Tower at all here. We just used the general result. So what is uh, without micron? What is the well, Vega approximation by Markov chain, by Martin Gates, theorems, by blah, blah, blah. What's that? What's the main thing to get So if it's not worth being recorded, maybe it can be discussed afterwards. I think it's fair. I mean, no, seriously, why? Sure, so then it should be recorded, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it should be recorded. Thanks. No, my, my, my well, I, I, I used to speak loudly, so, so I guess I was... Uh, uh, it was easy to, to hear me without a microphone, but, uh, well, for this talk, uh, well, it's probabilistic limit theorem, so it should be uh, something in the background mentioned, what, is, what are the methods, not only the model, but also what are the methods, and it was my, uh, well, next question with microphone, uh, that the methods, in my impression, it was the young towers, which are not known to me uh, very well, 
but uh, I can believe that you people in, in uh, ergodic theory can develop such, 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 such methods specific. But uh, when the point processes appear, it's, it's classical. I mean, it's very classical topics. And, and my question is how to get convergence of point processes, which is crucial for this talk, in my, mm -hmm. in my impression. Um, so, so I answer, but it's more about the paper with Benoit Sosol. Uh, so, of course, we use the Kallenberg uh, method, and uh, and uh, to prove Kallenberg uh, two condition, we used first uh, something saying that the short return does not occur or only with a very small probability, and the other thing is a, is a kind of uh, decorrelation in some sense. It is not, well, it is not, uh, well, uh, there is an additional... Yes, it, is, uh, divide, it can be, roughly speaking, divided into... Uh, well, you know, it, there is only one condition to check. But to check this condition, we usually divide in two steps. One to say that uh, short returns are very rare, and the other to say that uh, there is some decorrelation. Yes. Yes, mainly these two theory, two results. So multiple exponential, multiple correlations, and also for if there are short, short returns, and then this dominated. So these are the two, <coughs> two main thing we prove. So thank you for these um, clarifications. Oh wow. <laughs> You were assuming that these cups were were identical. So yes. what if they are not identical? Or I can also formulate it in the following way: you take an infinite horizon Lorentz mm -hmm. process with two types of scatterers mm -hmm. periodically, and one type is of alpha type, the other one the cusp okay. is alpha type, beta type. Oh, two so different beta. Oh, that's I mean that's that's possible. <laughs> that will change. I think that will change the limit. I think that I, I, yeah, we never do that, but I, be, I believe from, it may follow from the same proof. If you change a different bait, for example, one cusp has a bait one, the other cusp has bait two and bait three, and I can, I imagine that the limit will be the summation of three independent stable random variables. I don't think it's just for convenience because there's one over three here, just like for for simple technical simplifications. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. So before we thank the speaker again, I would like to remind you that there is a poster session starting at four, but I don't know where it is. Maybe Francoise knows? It's here. It's here, just in the hall. Okay. So poster session uh, starting at four and then coffee starting at at um, five, yes, and next talk at half past five. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.